They'll find that hope that comes through Jesus Christ. God, I don't want this just to be a regular day to where we punch a time clock of faith, we punch a time clock of worship, and we just do our, our, our routine. God, I want this to be a day that we just simply let go and let you do whatever you want to do. So God, just have your way. Have your way in all minds and all hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Now, I know last week I said we were starting a two-part series on what happens when you can't see clearly, but clearly God has other plans than I had. And so I am not going to the second part of that series. Um, we're just going to go straight to what God has for us. So I want you to go to Luke, if you would. And we're going to dive in. I know it's still November, but man, I cannot get away from this passage of the Christmas story. I've been in it all week. I've been in it just studying it, listening to it, and letting God speak through it. And so I, I was looking at something that we looked at four years ago, and God just really brought it back out in my heart in such a real way. And, and so I want, to, I want to take a deep look, if you would, at the Christmas story. And if God lets us do this for the next few weeks, that's what we're going to do. But today, I want you to understand something. I want you to write it down. The Christmas story screams one anthem. And that is that God uses ordinary to create extraordinary things. He uses ordinary people, ordinary, uh, ordinary things, ordinary places to do extraordinary works. And in our lives, a lot of times we count ourselves out. We mark ourselves down as unusable. Or we count others out because of what they've done or where they've been. And, and we feel like that we don't have enough. To offer God or maybe that, that we don't, don't, don't own enough to offer God anything. That our name means nothing. That our, our, our value is, is very limited because of maybe our possessions or maybe our fame. Or I don't know what it is that puts that mindset in us. Maybe it's our shame. The shame that we shouldn't be carrying. The shame that Jesus took the cross and, 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 he, and he died for. The shame that literally God screams out. He wants the shame off of you today. And never once has God screamed out, shame on you. And today, as we look, I want you to examine yourself. And I want you to take the story and make it personal. There's things that happen that are so miraculous. But the things that God did through this Christmas story are very symbolic of the things that God wants to do in your and my life today. So I'm going to start, if you would, in verse number 26 of chapter number 1. And it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village of Galilee, verse 27, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Now, I want you to understand this and write this down. Three things that God does. God uses unconventional methods, unconventional people, and unconventional circumstances to do something that's incredible. Mm -hmm. In other words, he doesn't get the person that fits the mold. He gets the person that literally, it seems like you're going to have to force them in if they're going to fit. He doesn't take the person that has it all together. And he doesn't go into circumstances that are man-created, that just seem perfect and right. God uses weird, unique, wonderful ways to usher his presence in. To declare who he is. I love this. If you, if you back up to verse number 27... I want you to circle this. Maybe it doesn't mean as much to you, but man, it grabs me. It says, Joseph, a descendant of King David. You know, King David's bloodline was the bloodline which Christ had to come through. And if you read Matthew chapter 1, it gives you that whole bloodline of how Jesus was brought into an existence. And, and I like that it says, Joseph was the descendant of a king. And today, I want you to know, and I want you to claim, and I want you to identify, you and I are descendants of a king also. And you and I have been called to usher in the presence of God. No, none of you are going to be virgins giving birth to Jesus. And none of us are going to be Joseph, hey, having to stay with a lady that says she's pregnant and knowing we didn't have sex with her. None of us are called to that. But we are still called to make Jesus known to the world around us, descendants of a king, for the purpose of pursuing and making the king available to others. And in this, I want you to realize that, that God is going to do things probably opposite of the way you think they should be done. And God is going to do things probably uh, against the plans that you and I create. Uh, how many of you know the verse? His ways are, what are they? They're, they're higher than ours. His thoughts are, are higher. Uh, uh, the imaginations that God has, we can't even get close to. I mean, you say, well, I want to know the heart of God. I, I, listen, I don't even think we can touch it. The Bible says, how deep, how wide, how long, God, Paul said, I want you to know what that is. But then again, there, we could dive in and swim into the ocean of God's love and never hit the bottom, never find the shore. You say, well, I want to I know just who God is. You can't, I can't, we can't wrap our mind around it. 
All I know is God is. And I believe that in the beginning, God created. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that God can speak and things just happen? Do you believe that God can step out and things be formed and fashioned? Do you believe that God can breathe and something come alive? Hey, if you don't, you're not alive today without the breath of God. And in there, I want you to understand that today, you may be looking at circumstances of your lives. You may be looking at bank accounts. And you may be looking at what's in your life thinking that God cannot use me. And I'm going to tell you, if all the circumstances around you don't work, and all your mindsets of who you are doesn't work, and all the methods that you have and plans you have says, there's no way that God can use me, be ready. You're the one that God's going to attack. You're the one that he's going to use. An ordinary person, a simpleton. Somebody that that doesn't have all the power. Why? Because those are the ones in which his power can be seen best. If somebody has it all together, a lot of times it's hard for them to realize they need a God. I mean, how many of you in here will admit gladly that you do not have it all together? All right. Uh, Bill came up to me today and introduced me to somebody and said, hey, he's crazy. So now there's two. I said, well, Bill normally sits here. And I said, you can sit near him. He's like, no, no, that's too much crazy. I said, yeah, you're right. Go to the other side and let's balance it out, right? The reality is this. None of us in here have it figured out. And none of us in here have it all right. We mess up. We fall short. But right there in our shortness and right there in our mess, God shows up and becomes available. Right there in the brokenness, God shows up with healing and inspiration. And so today, I want you to look at this. I want you to understand the process of how God takes ordinary and changes it in to extraordinary. And so I, I want you to look at two things, all right? So we're going to answer the question in the next four weeks that God allows. We're going to answer these four things. We're going to what it takes to be used. We're going to answer number two, how he does what he does. Number three, who he actually uses. And number four, why he wants to use you and what he wants to do while using you. So today, let's dive in to these two things of what it takes. All right. Number one, it takes faith. Look at look at this verse, if you would, in Hebrews 11. We talked about it a little bit last week. It says, and it is impossible to please God without what? Faith. It says anyone who wants to come to him must do two things. Number one, believe he exists. And number two, I believe that he rewards those who sincerely, diligently seek him. In other words, today, without faith, it's not going to be possible. And and here's why we need faith, because at some point in every one of our lives, God is going to show up and ask us to do something that goes against everything we think is possible. God is going to ask us to step out. And so when that happens, there's two things we must be willing to give up. Number one, our entire life. Our plans, our dreams, our, our expectations. Our, our, our standards and ways of living. When God shows up and says, hey, I want you to take on something, just like he showed up to Mary and said, I want you to take on something extraordinary. At that moment, you and I have to make a decision to say, okay, God, here's my life. I'm all in. Like Moses, we talked about this. He had a staff in his hand and a stuttering problem. And God said, Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver the nation of Israel. And Moses said, hey, I, 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 I can't. And God says, I'm going to speak through you, buddy, but what's in your hand? And that staff represented his identity, and that staff represented his income, and that staff represented his influence. That staff was everything that Moses was, and God said, lay it down. And when Moses took his staff and laid it down before God, what happened? The staff came alive. It became a snake. Then when God said, pick it up, Moses picked it up, and what happened to the staff? It died. Hey, listen, we've said this before. I'll say it again. When you have your life in your control and in your hands, it is dead. But when you surrender your life before God, giving him your influence, giving him your income, giving him everything that makes you you, then God will bring you to life and then do something wonderful through your life. Listen, after that point, from that point on, no longer is it referred to as Moses' staff. Instead, throughout the rest of the Bible, it's referred to as the rod of God. Listen to me. We need people today that are no longer walking in the identities that were created by their carnal natures, but instead are walking in their deliverance and walking in their freedom. No longer children of the world, children of Satan, father of lies. No, instead children of God, walking in the power of God, rods of God doing powerful things across the world. So here's Mary, ordinary virgin Mary. And God shows up to Gabriel and says, hey, you've got favor. You know, in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, many times it's mentioned that you and I have the favor of God on our lives. The fact that you're alive and healthy today, God's favor is on you. The fact that salvation is being made known and ringing through your ears, ringing through this church. The fact that we're saying the name of Jesus, God's favor is on you. 
And today, if Gabriel could appear to each and every one of us in this moment, which he could if God wanted him to, by the way, if Gabriel were to appear to each and every one of us, I guarantee you, as he's laid out the plan that God has for his life, that promise is there that God's favor is on you. In other words, hey, God is in this, and if God is in this, it's not going to fail. God has got this, and if God has got this, it's not going to fail. But you and I at some point have to say, God, here's my life. And I'm going to tell you this, when God calls you to do something, it will change the rest of your life. Look, I never wanted to be a pastor, but I am so glad that I am. I never wanted to do this. This was not my plan. If you've been here for years, you know that. I wanted to be a politician, wanted to be the lawyer, wanted to do these things. But I am so thankful that there was an encounter with Jesus Christ. There was an encounter with a moment that God came into my life and said, this is my plan for you. And in that life, he called for two things, for me to surrender my life and to surrender my circumstances. To lay it down and say, God, okay, I'll do what you want me to do. Now look at this. In verse number 29 of our text in Luke chapter number one, it says, confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what this could mean. It's kind of a Gideon moment, like, are you sure you know what you're talking about? No, are, are you sure you know who you're talking to? Would you agree with me that Mary probably had better plans than that for her life? I mean, don't you think that, that, that Mary had, had bigger plans than, than being a virgin, going to mom and dad and saying, mom, dad, I've never had sex, but I'm knocked up, I'm pregnant. You know, Joseph, we're not married yet, and I know we haven't slept together yet, but I'm pregnant, and it's not yours. Do you think that's her plan? Or do you think that when God showed up, he had a bigger plan, something more wonderful that he wanted to accomplish in her life? And I'm, I'm going to ask you to do this. Whatever plan you have for your life, know that it's not good enough unless God is the one laying it out. Whatever you think your limitations are, know that you can exceed those far beyond as long as you let God lay out the steps. The Bible says he directs the steps of the godly. He delights in the details of their lives. God is in every moment. And what men mean for evil, God will work for good. Nothing is impossible to those that are in God. Anything is possible to someone who believes. Many times, 365 times, he tells us, don't be afraid. Hey, listen, God's got everything worked out, so stop trying to work it out because it's wearing you out in the process. And instead, say, okay, what is it? And Mary's sitting there, she's confused. This isn't my plan. This isn't what I wanted. How many of you have had days like that? Anybody ever had the circumstance come into your life that you're like, okay, God, are you serious? Like, really? This, this is what you want? This is it? And look at this. As, as Mary keep reading, verse number 30, the angel says, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Verse 31, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him a throne of his ancestors, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Matter of fact, I was telling my praise team this this morning. This is not my message, and I'm trying not to get caught up on it. But if you would take those verses, start in verse number 29 and go all the way through verse number 37 and just circle the word will. I'm using the NLT version. You'll find that word appearing again and again and again, meaning there is no doubt, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that God will do what God has promised that he will do. And he's saying, hey, these verses are the things that Jesus will do. These are the things that Jesus will accomplish. You will have a baby and he will get the throne of God and his kingdom will have no end. He's saying, hey, look, Jesus will accomplish what he's supposed to do. He will accomplish the things that have been laid out for him and it will not end. And so now I need you to give me those, your life, give me your circumstances. I mean, if you were married, wouldn't you have wanted to have been married and had that baby in a hospital? I mean, not, not in a manger say, a setting, in a cave somewhere where all these animals are moving and, uh, and bad and, and poops everywhere. I mean, think about it. It's not a, an, it's not a, a pretty scene. I mean, I, I don't believe that Mary and Joseph had this moment where Mary looks at Joseph and says, this is exactly how I envisioned this would be. I guarantee you, Mary had different, different mindsets. I mean... Don't you think that if God had wanted to, he could have just said to Jesus, Jesus, I want you to just go down there and appear. Tell him you're the son of God. Die for him. Oh, they'll believe. Oh, he just appeared out of anything. But nope, we're going to use a virgin to get you there. Hey, hey, Abraham, 
Go up on the top of the mountain. You're going to find a lamb there, and you're going to present it as a sacrifice to me. Don't you think that God could have still been God by just telling Abraham that there was going to be a lamb on the top of the hill? But no, God says, Abraham, take your son and sacrifice him to me. Don't you think that God could have called Noah and said, Noah, this is the highest mountain, and I want you to take your family, and I want you to move to the top of that mountain because I'm going to flood everything else. And you're going to have a firsthand view as everything else floods, but you're going to be safe if you're on top of that, of that mountain. Is that what God did? Absolutely not. No, you're going to build a boat longer than three football fields, and you're going to fill it with every animal, and you're going to float above the storm. Now listen to me. Don't you think that he could have gone to Moses and said, Moses, let's leave the, will, the, the, the Egypt and let's go this route. We're going to bypass the Red Sea, get right into the wilderness, and we're going to be where we need to be. Nope, God takes him right to the Red Sea so that he could part it. Here's, I want you to write this down. God is going to do extraordinary things, and that is why your circumstances are not always going to make sense, and your things that you planned are not always going to work out. Why? Because God's going to do things in his way. Why? Three things. Write them down. Here's why God does it that way. Number one, so that we will know it was him. You ever had that moment that you knew it was God? I had a moment this week that I'm not allowed to tell you about yet. All right, and in that moment, my little brother, Nathaniel, handicapped, brain damaged, terminally ill, walked up to me and spoke something that I know he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. We haven't told anybody. And he comes up and he says it to me and he looks at me and he says, I'm this, this, this. And I was like, how do you know that? Where's that going to come from? And he, he spoke it. My little brother has done that to me before. Driving on the road years ago, nine years ago, I had him in my Jeep. And, and we're driving on the road. And all of a sudden, he looks at me. And remember, he's a simple mind. He's in a, a 30-year-old body, 31-year-old body. But his mind is a five, six, seven-year-old. And it'll never grow beyond that. And he looks at me and he tells me, he goes, I went to heaven last night. And I was like, you what? He said, I went to heaven last night. I said, what are you talking about? I said, he can't read, he can't write. He said, I was walking on these shiny roads and there was water that was so clear. And he starts describing heaven and I'm like pulling my Jeep over because it's like, he doesn't know this. He, he hasn't been taught this. He hasn't, he hasn't read this. And I look at that and I think to myself, why does God work that way? So that you know that God showed up. So that you know that God did it. Hey, pray this prayer in your life. We prayed over this church. Pray it for yourself. God, do something so big and extraordinary through my life that no one can take credit for it but you. That no one would be able to deny it. And you're saying, God, work it out my way. No, you'd rather let him work it out his. Because when God does it, it empowers you. And when you know that God came through, when an, a an angel looks at you and says, you're going to be a virgin having a baby, it's a whole lot better than one day having a baby and having this thought, maybe I'm the virgin. Maybe I'm the person. Or, or no, 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 let, let me marry him first, God, and, and then we'll, we'll have relationship, and then we'll create the baby. And no, that baby couldn't come from Joseph. That baby couldn't come from a corrupted seed. That baby had to come from incorruption and purity. And so God says, your way is have sex, and then the baby comes. But my way is, let me just touch you. Let the Holy Spirit just highly lay a hand on you. And you're going to be pregnant with a perfect seed. And so today, may the Holy Spirit touch your heart like he's touched hers so that something is born in you that's not of man so that something's created in you that's not of this world so that you will know that God is God and there is no doubt second reason he does things that way is so that people will see him through you the worst thing you can do with a miracle is stay quiet about it the worst thing you can do with a message of God is keep your mouth closed the worst thing you could do with the, the grace and the mercy that God has shown you is to say, well, I don't want to boast. Listen, hey, yes, good. Don't boast when it's about you, but when it's about God, boast all you want. When it's about who he is, let it be known. You know what that is? That's giving him glory and that's giving him praise. And God works in miraculous ways, extraordinary ways, supernatural ways. Why? So you'll know it's him and so the people will know that it's him working through you. And number three, so that he gets all the glory. So that he receives the credit. All right, now look at this, if you would. Not only does it take, number one, us giving faith, which requires our lives and our surrender of circumstances, but number two, it requires faithfulness. All right, now I want you to understand this. Mary could not have given birth to Jesus Christ had she not first made the choice to live right. Are you with me? If Mary was not a virgin, would she have been able to bring Jesus into the world? Absolutely not. 
See, there's a big difference in faith and faithfulness. You can be full of faith, which means I believe something can happen and still see nothing. It's faithfulness, faith in action that brings the extraordinary out. Now look at this. I want you to read verse number 34 through verse number 37. It says that Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I am a virgin. Listen to me, church. Listen to me, singles. Listen to me, teenagers. Listen to me, dating couples that are not married yet. Do right. Just do right. Do what God has told you to do and believe it and trust it and follow it. No matter what people say, no matter what other people do, and no matter what other people think, do what is right. It puts you in position to be used in an amazing way by an almighty God. Just do what's right. Hey, children of God, couples, listen to me. At some point, we've got to make the decision. You say, well, if Christ calls me, then I'll make it. No, Christ will call you once the decision's been made. And when you say, hey, I'm going to walk right, and I'm going to do right, I'm going to live right, then the calling of God is going to fall on your life. But don't ask and pray for God to reveal what you need to be doing with the rest of your life when you're not doing what he's already revealed should be done with your life. You're saying, God, I want to follow you. I want to go on the other side of the world and preach the gospel. Then are you telling your neighbors that Jesus is alive today? God, I want to be a church that's on fire and powerful. Then do you have a home that's on fire and powerful? You say, I want to go, and I want to go to the house of God, and I want to worship. Do you worship in your shower? Do you worship in your prayer closet? I mean, do you get your worship on driving down the road? You say, I hope today's a powerful service. That comes from powerful servants. You say, what are you saying? Hey, it comes from somebody saying, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to choose to do what's right regardless of what anybody else thinks, says, or does. I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow through. Look at these verses. She says, I'm, I'm just a virgin. Here's the four wills that God will do for you. Start in verse number 35. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit, number one, will come. How am I going to do this, God? The Holy Spirit's going to show up. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. God, I, okay, great. I'm going to get pregnant. Then what? And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You're not going to be powerless. Holy Spirit's going to come and touch you, and then you're going to get power. Everybody says the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. No, the Holy Spirit came down on Mary, came down on Zacharias, came down on all these. You read these passages. Before Jesus came, the Holy Spirit came. And then when Jesus left, the Holy Spirit came back. And he made his notes available to all in the moments before Christ. The Holy Spirit was only given by the divine nature of God and two people that God willed. Now Christ, since he died, buried, rose again, and dwells in your heart, the Holy Spirit's available to all. And at any moment, the Holy Spirit's power will enable you. And the power of God will overshadow everything you do. So one thing I pray, I prayed this week. I said, God... Just let me know I'm still connected to you. I don't ever want to be in something to where I get connected to something other than him. Help me to know that you're still with me in ministry. You say, well, you're doubting it? No, I just doubt myself. I can get motivated by the wrong things. Anybody else in here? I mean, I, I went to Dollar General the other day to get my wife a specific food. I passed by. The aisles, I had everything else. I grabbed the food and I walked back and I paused. I stepped back. I looked down and there's Christmas tree De Little Debbie's. <laughs> they were on the bottom shelf. Don't even know how I saw them. It's like there's a radar that goes off that they're near. And I step back and I say, yeah, I need those. <laughs> I go home. I eat one, one. And then Jordan comes back out and says, how many did you eat? There's only one left. I said, I only had one. How's there only one left? She goes, oh, there's only five in the box. I was like, but I wanted all of them. <laughs> you ate half. You ate more than half. You don't love me. You know, it's like everything's in question. No, I'm just kidding. You say, what happened? And there I was motivated by what? Sweet. That's sweet. It motivated me. It called me. It inspired me. You say, what did it inspire you to do? To eat something I didn't need to eat, eat something I'm trying to stay away from, to absorb something into my body that's not healthy at all. And you say, what do you mean? I can be motivated by the wrong things very easily. Anybody else on that? 
Hey, you write this down. Those of you that have talent and ability, those of you that are called in ministries, the most dangerous thing that can happen to your ministry and will test it the most is success. It's not adversity and it's not attacks. It's when you start making it and dreams start coming true and God starts showing off and then you think it was you. You see, we can get motivated by the wrong things and there's times in my life just like yours and I'm sitting there and I say, God, I want to know you're with me that I'm not doing this because of me and I'm not doing this because the auditorium fills up and I'm not doing this because people say good job. God, I want to know that you're in this and that this is about you. I don't want anything else. I want it to be you to show me that you're there. And man, right about that time, I got the best news that I could possibly receive. And I'm like, okay, God, you're good. You're amazing. Why? Because God will overshadow you with his power. It's like a total eclipse as God comes in and blocks out every harmful ray that wants to destroy your life and lets you know his presence is there. That's the second will. Look at the, I, see, I told you I was going to get hung up on him. So the baby uh, will be uh, born. It, it, it will be holy. In other words, this will, this will be pure. And, and then it goes on and he will be called the son of God, meaning, hey, provision. His name is Jesus. It goes on, what's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her own age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. Hey, will you write this down on a side note? Um, God will never, ever call you to go at it alone. God will always send somebody to war with you. You say, well, I, there's been a lot of circumstances that I've gone through alone. Listen to me. God will connect you at the right times. You may not have recognized it, but God will put people in your path that will help you get where you're going. It's no accident that Elizabeth is already six months pregnant when Mary gets this news. Matter of fact, if you read later in this passage, the very first thing Mary does once this angel leaves is goes and sees Elizabeth. Why? Because she's got to know it's true. And when she walks into Elizabeth's presence, Elizabeth said, the baby in me is jumping. Hey, the Holy Spirit's on you. Hey, this baby that's been sent, the prophecy was that he would shine a light and he would, he would be that prophet that led in to Christ's ministry. He's leaping inside of me. There's a message already being preached. You're, you're, you're pregnant, Mary. You know what? Listen to me. God is always going to come alongside of you and confirm and affirm his calling in your life. Look at this. Look at this next verse. Would you read this verse with me? Actually, read it on your own. Ready? One, two, three, go. Say it again. Okay. Nothing. Let's put that word into our vocabulary, and let's push impossible out. Hey, what, what is it that God isn't capable of doing? Well, there's, there's nothing. Hey, what, what is it that can defeat me? Nothing. What is it that can separate me from the love of God? Nothing. What is it that can tear me down? What is it that'll send me to hell? What is it? Hey, in Jesus Christ, there is nothing. And today, listen, we need some people that come alongside and say, okay, God, I'm gonna believe in who you are. There's a big difference, church, in being full of faith and being full of faithfulness. There's a huge difference. So look at this. Faithfulness doesn't mean you simply believe it. It means, number one, you believe it so much that you commit your entire life to it. All right, what are you doing with your life and who are you living your life for? A faithful person has committed their entire life to God. Now, when you say that, and a lot of times that's said in church, a lot of times we think that's the people working in your church. Absolutely not. It's just the person, whether it's a businessman, whether it's a teacher or stay-at-home mom, it doesn't matter. Whoever it is that says, my whole life and my whole existence is for God, that's a faithful person. That's somebody who is acting on what they believe. All right, number two, it says this. You are willing uh, to risk it all, if that's what it takes, to accomplish the goal. I mean, how much ridicule do you think uh, Mary got? I mean, think about it. Had Mary walked into the modern-day church claiming today, let's say that today was the biblical day, that Jesus had not been born, Jesus had not been crucified, and Jesus had not risen from the dead. If Mary walked into this church, this church, and said, I'm pregnant, I'm a virgin, and it's Jesus, doesn't it make you shudder to think what the church would say to her? Does it, does it, does it, does it pierce your heart to think of what our response would be? Hey, listen, somebody that's faithful, they don't care. They're willing to risk everything, including their reputation, including their comfort, including their friendships, if that's what it takes to get the name of God out. 
They're willing to step out and, and take it on. They've given their life to it, but they're giving everything, everything they have. They're risking it all. Number three, you're willing to do what's right no matter what others say, do, or think. So look at this verse in James. Ready? We're almost done. So you see, by faith by itself, what's the next two words? It isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is what? Dead and useless. I'm going to say this to you today, church. Listen to me. Today, you can come in here today and tell me everything you believe, but if we don't see any works, then your faith is worthless. You can say, well, I believe Jesus loves people, then who are you loving on? I believe God is a provider, then who are you providing for? I believe that God loves everybody, then who are you taking the message to? You say, well, I believe. If you truly believe, then we would see what you believe coming in actions. There's a difference in faith and faithfulness. And today, we need people that realize it requires faith, but it also requires faithfulness. Faith is when you take the shot. The, the faithfulness is the follow-through. Faithfulness says, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going I'm to keep doing this. I'm going to continue. Now, how many times have you started something because you felt like God called you to it, but the moment it got difficult, you quit? The moment it got hard, you backed out. You know, we always use tithing here. I guarantee you, anything you lay down to God, Satan's going to try to attack. Moses laid down his rod, right? He laid down his staff, and what is one of the very first things that happened? The magicians of Egypt laid down theirs too. And theirs turned into snakes too. Meaning this, that they, they were standing in their witchcraft, and they were standing in their rich witchery, and they were demonic, and they were able to convert these things. But guess what? Moses' staff, the Bible says, his snake began to eat all the other snakes. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Pharaoh, my heart's not getting hard. It's going into cardiac arrest. Yeah. All these snakes on the floor, and then all of a sudden one's eating another one right in front of my eyes. I'm freaking out. But you know what? When someone doesn't have faith and someone doesn't have faithfulness, they don't see what God is trying to accomplish. And they don't get to experience the benefits of what God's wanting to do. I don't want that to happen to you. If you want to be extraordinary with your life at some point, this is what it takes. You've got to believe that God can. Hey, that's what if, uh, uh, Hebrews eleven six believe that he exists and believe that he's the rewarder of those that sincerely seek him. Number two, you got to follow through. I believe he exists, and now I'm going to act on it. In other words, I'm going to be the teenager that doesn't do what all the other teenagers are doing. Even if they're making fun of me and giving me peer pressure, I'm not giving in. I won't take that drink because I don't want that corruption. I won't try that pill because I don't want that pollution. I'm not going to give away my body just because everybody else is giving away theirs. I'm not going to walk in this lifestyle and do these things just because everybody else is walking and doing them. Hey, the child of God says, hey, I'm not going to go to work and put money in my pocket that's not mine. I'm not going to go to work and sleep on the time clock and rob from my boss. I'm not going to go cheat. I'm not going to go gossip. I'm not going to go backstab. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to follow through with what God's done in my life because can I tell you this? The prize is worth it's worth the struggle. The prize is worth the effort. It's worth the energy. There is no high like the most high. And at some point, we've got to get to that point where we say, I'll give you everything because I am going to give it my life. I'm going to risk it all, and I am going to do it no matter what. And look at how Mary replies. We'll close with this verse. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And immediately the angel left her. Today I'm here just to ask you to do this. Number one, are you a child of God? Is there a moment in your life that you believed in what Jesus Christ did for you? And then has there been a moment that you confess that Jesus is Lord? If that answer is yes, then at what point of your life have those words come out of your mouth? I am a servant of God. And may everything you said Everything you've written, everything you've promised, may it come true in my life, God, because I'm going to give it all. I'm going to step out in faith because I believe and follow through with faithfulness because you deserve it. I am a servant. Today, Carrie stood and Nick stood, and they made it easy for you to be a servant. Because of their service, and I'm not trying to toot their horns, but because of what they do, they stood here and said, hey, this Thursday... From 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. You don't have to be there the whole day. Just an hour of your time if that's all you got. Your lunch break if that's what you got. Come help. Hand out. We got plenty of provisions. We need people to help us hand those out. 
And then they follow up and say, hey, December the 20th, 21st, and 22nd, we're going to be handing out food. We're going to be handing out this. We're going to set up and we're going to do, hey, here's a way to be a servant. You know what I've found? Servants are always calling others to service. They're always inspiring somebody else to get up. They're always leading somebody else to an act of kindness, to an act of worship, to an act of service of the king. And Mary said, hey, I am your servant, and I will do it. I will do it. So whatever you've said, may it come true in my life. And because of her faithfulness, the Son of God was born. Because of her follow-through, you and I are now children of the King. Other servants have been raised because of the service of one who said, I have faith, and I will be faithful. So I ask you, bow your heads and close your eyes, and I want you to answer those two questions. Are you a child of God? Are you saved? Do you know that you have Jesus in your heart? Do you know that you have been redeemed? Do you know that you've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? Has there been a moment that you said to God that you believed? Has there been a moment that you confessed to others that Jesus is Lord? Has there been that moment? Give me a second before you play. And if not, will you take that moment now? How many of you say, without a shadow of a doubt, I am a child of God. I know I am saved. Would you raise your hand and testify? And while it's there, praise him. Would you just say thankful? Thank you, God. It's just a thankful prayer. Yeah, thank you for saving me. Hey, man, what a wonderful declaration in life. Now, is there anyone here today that maybe you haven't accepted, but you do believe? That belief alone needs faithfulness. It needs the follow through. It says in Romans 10, if we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, it makes us in right standing with God. But if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus, we will be saved. At some point, at some point, you've got to take your faith into faithfulness and you've got to declare Jesus is Lord. And so right now, I'm going to give you that opportunity. If you believe that God is and you believe that Jesus was and you believe that Jesus died and now he is ruling and reigning, if you believe that, that's step one. You make that confession to God. But I'm going to, will you make the, the, the follow through, the second step? Will you make that known? Is there anybody here today that would stand or maybe at home watching on, online or maybe listening? Would you in this moment just simply testify, confess it to God, but then lift a hand and say, Jesus is Lord. Anyone today that's not sure of their salvation, I'm going to give you a moment. Is there anybody in here that would say today, this is going to be the day of my salvation. Jesus is Lord. Would you testify to that? We'll give you a second. Go. Anybody at all? Okay, good. That brings us to this next question. Have you ever got to the point in your life where you say, God, I want to be your servant. I don't want to be just save somebody on my way to heaven. I want to be your servant. Somebody being used. Somebody giving you all the glory. Somebody that, man, life's not comfortable. Before you sign up for this, understand, you can ask Mary, life's not comfortable. He does it unique ways. Why? So that you will know it was him so others know that it was him through you, and number three, he gets the glory. I mean, don't you think it's a better story when God shows up and parts a sea, other than we took a journey around it? Don't you think it's a better story that God parked my boat on top of a mountain? Don't you think that, hey, when I was going to strike my son, an angel grabbed my hand, and God pointed out that there was a lamb for me to sacrifice. Isn't that much better than the way that they would have done it if it was up to them? And if you're going to sign up for service, then you're going to have to say, here's my life. But God, I will take on adverse circumstances. I will take on conflict. I will take on hardship. Why? Because I wanted you to get the glory in all things. In all things. And I wonder, is there anybody here today that would just maybe turn around at their seat or maybe grab an altar, whatever God leads you to do? Or maybe just stand to your feet and say, here I am, God. I want to be a servant. I have faith, but I want to be found faithful. I'm going to pray. We're going to play, and I'm going to ask you to do what God is calling you to do in your life today. We'll say goodbye online. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for this. And I pray that you'll take this invitation. May your army be called and may it be raised. May ordinary people take on.